All right, welcome everyone to Kentsco Rocks episode number 20, the podcast that is everything to do with Kentsco EMS, Kentsco Cloud, Kentsco Community, just pretty much what's going on with one of the best .NET content management systems out there and also best headless CMSs out there. Hey, my name is Brian McKeever. I'm the author of Kentsco Rocks. You'll notice that uh, previously I've always had my partner in crime, Brian Soltis. Unfortunately, he's kind of moved right on from Kentsco and then is in the Microsoft world, so Guess what? You're just stuck with me. Today's episode of the 20th episode of Kentico Rocks is going to be about how to leverage Kentico best in Microsoft Azure. Because again, there's many different ways that you can deploy and host your sites that you build with Kentico or Kentico Cloud. But really, in my mind, for the money and for the experience and for the flexibility, Microsoft Azure is pretty much the best solution out there. I mean, you can argue with me all day if you want to. But you'd be wrong. Um, you know, I've had people say that AWS is the leading choice, and maybe a couple of years ago I might agree with that. But in this day and age, not so much anymore. Especially with a lot of clients that we deal with, you know, they have actually free free spend with Azure, which makes it pretty nice as well. But really, if you're talking about Azure uh, with Kentsco, the best, most efficient way to do it is platform as a service. So we're gonna go over that today a little bit. How do we deploy that? What some are some advantages? Why would you use Platform as a Service or an Azure App Service to host your Kentico site and deploy it? But before we get there, we're probably actually, I, I do, I, there's one other thing I wanna bring up, which is there are some new tools out there like the .NET Core CLI and others that you can use to really get started with Kentico quickly. So before we deploy our code, we have to have something, right? And I thought it would make sense to go over a cool new way that you can do that. And again, it doesn't really necessarily have to be Kentico Cloud or Kentico EMS. You can use this tool for both. I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the Kentico, si Kentico Cloud side of the fence just because I've got some tools that uh, the Kentico team has made for us that we can leverage. And actually, frankly, I've been kind of presenting on .NET Core and .NET Core CLI lately, and I just thought, hey, why not share it on the Kentico Rocks podcast because it's good, valuable resource information. So again, main agenda today, how do we use Azure with Kentico? How do we you know, get the most out of it? How do we start our code efficiently? How do we build a project that we can deploy into Azure? We're gonna go through that. And, and yeah, actually, as you, if you're looking at this on my blog or on YouTube, or maybe Twitch, depending on where we publish it, you'll notice that's actually a video episode. Uh, so there's a video that goes along with this podcast in case you didn't know. But again, if you're just subscribing via iTunes uh, and listening to it, that's fine too. I will try to narrate as best I can. But yeah, this is a whole new world for me, right? I've actually got a little setup where I can put my face over the top of my screen. And I thought that was pretty cool uh, to way to do this because it's becoming more popular. We're doing like the whole live coding thing, I guess. Uh, that's what the kids like these days. But uh, actually, it's kind of fun to do something different uh, as well. So we well, might as well get right into it, right? Part part one or part two, part one of part two is, is talking about how, how could we get started with making a site that we could deploy to Azure. So... I'm going to talk a little bit about the .NET Core CLI, and uh, if you want to know more, I, I, I do a Google search because it's all over the place. The first search result you're going to get is going to have some great information, but really the .NET Core CLI is built around how do we actually run commands at, on a CLI and automate things. That's the main reason, um, and we might as well just break into it, I guess, since we I want to show something. So. Again, first time I'm doing this, if it's a little rough, I apologize, I will get better at it. But if we do .NET Core CLI in Google, it's gonna tell us right off the bat, it's a command line utility. Uh, and here's how you can get it. Uh, chances are you actually already have .NET Core uh, CLI in your tool set if you have Visual Studio 2017 or Visual Studio 2019, not a big deal there. Uh, if you don't, you can download the SDK, the 2.2 SDK. And who knows, maybe after build this week or next week, whenever it is, uh, you might be able to get the .NET Core 3, but I'm going to focus right now on 2.2. There's a set of commands that the CLI gives us. I'll show off a couple of these today. And, you know, I'm not going to do all of them just because we'd be here all day. I don't think you want to watch me go through every one of these. That'd be pretty boring. But the main thing is this is a tool that, uh, is a, it, it, you know, it allows you to do repetitive tasks in an automated way. Anything that you can do in the Visual Studio interface as far as creating projects, adding references to other projects, creating solutions, deploying things, pretty much you can do it in the .NET Core CLI, which is why I think it's a tool that most developers who are in the .NET world should really know about. 
uh, we're going to start using it at BizStream more and more to do all of our projects and try to automate as much as we can. Even the spin-up, because the spin-up of a project, you know, if you're if you're dealing with many, many projects that are of the same way, you, like maybe you have Kentco as a standard in your in your organization and you want to make sure all the new projects start the same way, that's where the CLI can come in handy. And again, I'm going to break out a little PowerShell because that's probably the best way to use it. And um, you can do this in the command prompt, but uh, it doesn't have as much syntax highlighting. And there's some weird syntax issues with the regular command prompts. So PowerShell is kind of the best. The other thing is you can do this in VS Code at the terminal. And you could have multiple terminals in there. I know a lot of people are fans of VS Code these days. I'm still kind of in the old world of uh, loving Visual Studio myself. But hey, you want to do VS Code, go right ahead. The commands are the same as long as you have the same pathing set up when you install it. So... Again, if we're going to talk about what to do here, uh, anytime that you're not sure, and actually I'll just start at the very basics, right? If we're doing .NET as a driver to our commands, I can use dash H and it's going to give me a bunch of help to do these things. So uh, we see that there's commands like add, build, new, publish. Uh, it The help tells us exactly what we need to do. And um, really for today's kind of podcast, I want to focus on what would I do to maybe create a new Kentico Cloud project uh, because again there's some great tools that Kentico has provided for us to do that so I'm gonna walk through what it takes to create a new cloud project in the CLI and then we'll move on to part two where we actually look at how where should we put that project once it's completed and ready to go or maybe even day one when I want to make sure I have a, a pipeline set up that I can deploy correctly so again uh, when you do that you're gonna use the .NET new command and I'll do an H for help as well the H uh, switch tells me what I can do with .NET new, but really it's create new projects. And the .NET core team has done a great job of creating templates for us that come out of the box with the ability to just make all these. these this list of new projects should be very similar to what you see in Visual Studio, right? You can create a web app, you can create an MVC app, a web API, uh, class library is probably the most common. All these different things like test libraries, you can make all that, uh, and you just need the actual short name to type into the, the command here to actually create that. And of course, I'm, I'm a, I have one that's special that I installed as a global tool or global template that we can add as well. Uh, but just to get the basics, I want to go back to the top. If I want to create a new project with the .NET Core CLI, I can actually say new. And actually, actually, uh, actually ooh, one important tip. Context is super important. So where you run the command it's inspecting the current directory and that's where it's going to put things and it's going to base names off things so i made a folder called cli just in case we want to store over i can delete the whole thing uh, but you know start in your normal place that you would want to make your source code repository available basically um, so context is important uh, but again if i do .NET new and i do class lib that's all it takes to actually create a brand new .NET project you can see we actually made cli.csproj and if I look at uh, what I've got here oops wow ignore that I'm gonna just cat out what's in the directory by using dir not cat as an empty thing um, it shows me that I have one class file created and one CS project file created in an object folder that's the absolute basics for creating projects you know it's the very starter step it's not gonna make a whole solution because we just said we wanted a new class library but when we type in, you know, .NET new class lib, this is what we get. Now, if we actually look at the CS project it made, it actually created the most simple way of making the new project system in .NET Core or .NET Framework. And then we gave us a target framework of .NET Standard 2.0. That's all we need to actually make a project. It's pretty cool, right? Now, it's also pretty basic. There's actually nothing in this class file other than some stubs of a namespace. But you'll notice both the CS proj that it creates and the class namespace just inherited the name CLI from the directory that we were in. That's why I was saying context is important. And this actually is something that you don't want probably. You don't actually want just the folder name of what you're doing. So I'm gonna go back to the clear the screen here and I'm gonna actually remove what we just did. Um, just prove that, now it's empty. And I'm gonna do that again. I'm gonna do .NET new class lib 
And this time I'm actually going to give it dash O for output name or folder. Actually, this is the output folder you want to put it in. I'm going to actually put it in Kentico lib. So again, I'm typing .NET new class lib dash O Kentico lib in a return. It's now created a new class library project called Kentico lib .cs pros. Same things. It's all the basics, but we now have things named in a kind of a much better way. And we have them in the subdirectory. So if I, uh, you know, again, if we change directory into that subdirectory of Kentico lib, we hit dir and there's our product. All right. Pretty cool. Very, very basic. Um, but one of the values you get here is that it doesn't have to be just a class library. So if I wanted to do .NET new in my template, I actually wanted to use something that is meaningful, like maybe create the Kentico Cloud boilerplate. I can do that using Kentico Cloud MVC as my short name for the template that I want to use to the CLI. And I'm going to give it a dash O. And actually, I know that this template actually creates a subdirectory, so I'm actually going to do dash N for name. And I'm going to call it Kentico MVC. And what that's going to do is it's going to use the template that uh, the Kentico Cloud team created that's up on GitHub for the Kentico Cloud boilerplate. And it's going to create that project for me. So if I look at my objects, ooh, I did it in the wrong place. I should have done it one out. All right, no big deal. I screwed up. We're going to get rid of that one more time. Um, actually, let me go into Kentico MVC. Make sure all the things are there. So you can see we uh, created some stuff. Sorry, I got to do this again because, of course, I typed it wrong. So I'm going to get rid of everything in there. And I'm going to remove dir Kentico MVC. Maybe that's the command. Yes, I think it is. Good. Okay, now we're back to just my plain class library in the Kentico lib folder. And I'm going to go back to my root. And I'm going to run that command again to create the MVC cloud boilerplate solution or project, actually. So .NET new. Kentico Cloud MVC, doing that, if I hit return, actually the right way, and it's told me that it's made a new project successfully. So now if we look at our solution, we've got a clean folder structure of Kentico Lib, Kentico MVC, and if I look into the Kentico MVC directory, you can see that we have a normal MVC website. And this is actually the .NET Core website, again, that's given to us by the Kentico Cloud team, available on GitHub, Links will be on this post later for to get to all this stuff. So pretty cool that we just did all that, right? It was very, very simple. Um, now what's missing is in a normal thing, a normal solution, you'd have a solution file, right? So there is a solution command to the .NET Core CLI. And basically, this is how you would manipulate a solution that exists already. But guess what? We actually have to make a new solution first. This part really threw me off with the .NET Core CLI. Um, it's actually the back to the .NET new command to make a solution file. And we're going to call it Kentico Cloud MVC. Yeah, that's good enough. So I'm creating a new solution file in the .NET Core CLI. And very fancy, we have a solution file that if we cat it out, very empty, right? Now we actually need to add the projects into the solution, of course. But again, we're doing this all through the command line. Why? Because we can automate it. That's why. So, you know, you do your manual steps one time, get it working, and then hopefully this can be the start of your spin-up process for every Kentico Cloud project that you do. I think this is pretty cool because before this was a complete pain in the butt with the old school like MS Build style project solution. All right, now uh, what I want to do is I'm going to go back to looking at that solution command in the .NET Core CLI and see that, okay, it gives me three options below here. I can actually add one or more projects into a solution file or list them or remove them. So I actually want to do a .NET solution add, and the next thing is going to be which, which project that we want to add. So I'm going to add the Kentico lib csproj file into the solution. I just typed that in right there. And if I click add, it's going to say, okay, I added it to the solution. And I'm going to do that same thing actually with the Kentico MVC project that we made. Again, this is important to get the right CS project file in there. And it's going to add that to the solution. So if we go one more time, look at our solution by catting it out, you can actually see at least somewhere in here that uh, da, 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 there it is. Got to scroll up a little bit more. 
we have a couple references to the project, right? So we've got a nice way to do all this. And just to kind of prove this all worked, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Visual Studio and I'm going to basically open it just to make sure that these things are working. So I'm going to say open a project solution. I'm going to browse not to my user directory because that's pretty stupid to my CLL directory or CLI directory. And you can see I've got a nice solution file that's coming up there in CLI called Kentico Cloud MVC Solution. And if I open that up, uh, hopefully, if things go fast enough, here we go. We have two projects, Kentico Lib and Kentico MVC. And it uh, looks like things are working, right? That's cool. Now, uh, the thing is, this is pretty standard, right? You'd make a class library and you'd make some shared reusable code and we'd add that into our, our website. Uh, but what's kind of missing here is that we don't actually have any dependencies yet to you know the, the one project from the next. So again, back to our nice .NET Core CLI helper, we can actually do that by using a different command. So if I do .NET new, actually no, not .NET new, this would be more like um, add a reference, right? So we want to do .NET add. So if I do that, um, I obviously type things wrong. Can't use .NET new, sorry. .NET add minus H. And it's gonna tell us that we can actually um, add a reference or a package. Like you can use this to add NuGet packages, excuse me, to your solution or add project to project references. So I'm gonna go into our Kentco MVC directory, because again, context is important. This will save me some typing. I'm gonna call .NET add reference. Uh, notice I did tab complete there. There's a little special trick to getting tab completion to work in PowerShell. It's on the documentation for .NET Core uh, CLI, but once you add it in, it's beautiful, because then tab completion is amazing. So I'm going to add a reference back to my project file of my Kensco lib to the current place I'm at. And it's going to figure that out, that I'm actually in the Kentico MVC directory, but I'm passing reference to this other CS project. So make this a project reference. And then it tells me, oh, reference is added to the project. Again, pretty slick. I don't know how much you'd actually do this part in pure CLI because it's still easier in Visual Studio, but, you know, the options are there. And what's neat is, notice how I didn't reload Visual Studio. It was already open. And uh, behind the scenes, it was watching, and it knows that we touched the project file of Kentico MVC as our MVC project. And it added in the reference automatically. So that's pretty cool that Visual Studio has changed, at least Visual Studio 2019 has changed, to allow you to do that, where you don't have to have that big thing that says reload the whole project, right? That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, now, just to prove this all works, what thing would you do next, maybe? You'd probably want to build. Oh, guess what? There's a command for that as well. So .NET. Um, there's a .NET restore if you need to restore packages, but there's also .NET build. And if you're not sure how to do that, use your dash H for your help. It's going to give you a bunch of options. It's really going to work on a project file that it finds. So we can do this, again, from this current location, or we can do it from others. Um, you know, I'll just do... .NET build right here, and that should build the MVC project. And um, yeah, I hope it actually works because I haven't actually tried it this exact way before because I had a .NET standard library that I'm adding as a reference to the Kentico Cloud Boilerplate, which is .NET Core. Uh, it should work because those two things are compatible normally. But if you look at the screen, and I'll just tell people who are listening, right now it actually took a while. It took about 20 seconds to do that. Because what was happening is it was running the full restore of all the NuGet packages from the MVC site for us. That's pretty cool, right? And here's where, you know, if you're a DevOps person, this should make you happy. Because it literally took 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, about 14 characters at a command prompt to build that. I think that's pretty cool. And it did build it, and it gave us the, you know, the fact that we have a .NET Core app with a DLL. And hey, guess what? You can actually run that from this command as well. So I'm going to actually do that. I'm going to do a .NET run. And again, if you're not sure, your dash H will tell you that here are all your options for how you can run things. So if I do .NET run, now here's where you do have to get kind of specific. 
So I'm actually going to go into my bin directory, into debug, into the standard or the, the framework that we're using. So .NET Core App 2.2, and I'm going to specify Kensco MVC, not Kensco Lib DLL, Kensco MVC DLL to make sure that that's the thing that we're actually going to run using the built-in .NET Core web server. So I'm hitting return on my command prompt. It's going to spin for a second because it's going to do its magic. And what should happen here is um, basically getting the fact that, ooh, we're spinning up the .NET Core into our web server. We're now listening on port 5000 or port 5001 for HTTPS. And if I switch over to my browser and I go to localhost port 5000, Drama, please. Oh, there's the Kentucky Cloud sample that comes with the Kentucky Cloud boilerplate. Running example that's running from everything I did, not just in Visual Studio, but just to prove this is actually the running request that came up for the, the internal .NET Core web server. Right? That's pretty awesome. We just did everything that you would normally do with Visual Studio from a command prompt using the .NET Core CLI. And that's why I think this tool is amazing because it can do a lot of cool things. You know, it doesn't have to just build restore, create new things. You can run projects, you can publish them to a file system, or more importantly, you can publish them to Microsoft Azure. And that's a perfect segue to think about what we're gonna talk next as part two of this blog post. So again, we have uh, Kensco Cloud here. Uh, it's a starter site that's running. I'm gonna skip a few steps. I'm not gonna actually use this. I wanna talk about a an instance of this that I've already published into Azure as an app service, because I thought having a real world example would be a little bit more interesting. So uh, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. We're gonna get to part two of the podcast, which is now deploying and using that .NET Core Kentco Cloud project in Azure. So here's our real world example. This is a project that uh, my team did at BizStream. It's uh, one of our own product sites. It's kstream.net. Full Kentco Cloud implementation. Um, it's got a you know home page, about page. There's software features. There's pricing tiers, things that you would expect of a, a SaaS product offering. Uh, that is actually running in Microsoft Azure. And to show that, I thought I would start here. I'm logged into my portal. Yes, I have Dark Theme. If you're not using Dark Theme in Azure Portal, you totally should be. And I'm looking at my app service that is Kstream.net. Now, this is my real production thing that's running, so please don't steal my keys and numbers. In fact, maybe I'll have to edit that out later. But basically, the important thing here is this is something that I configured. It's running at the production slot of the Azure App Service. So if we look at deployment slots, that's one of the main reasons that I love Azure for how to leverage Kensco Cloud deployments or even Kensco EMS deployments. We actually have two slots. A slot is like a complete copy of an instance of the file system, the app settings, everything you need, but you can stop it and start it and swap it out with production as much or as little as you want. And you can even, if you want to, move around some traffic to do some different things. But th you know, for the main website, think of kstream.net as my de first deployment slot that's in my Azure app. That thing has a spot on the file system of our Azure app and it has settings um, and it has the ability to scale up, scale down. There's a, many, many things you can do in an Azure App Service. Uh, but, you know, importantly, uh, your app settings that you create can kind of determine how you do on performance and things like that. So actually in one of my talks, I talk about how to optimize an Azure App Service for performance. But out of the box, if you, if you just fire up an Azure App and push your code here, um, you're going to get basically the latest and greatest .NET framework and you're going to get basic settings that allow you to just, the site will be really, really fast. And then you're going to get the ability to have app settings that override something that's in your web config or things like that. So I have a couple in here. For instance, I have the ASP.NET Core environment variable of production to make sure that this is actually running in a production environment. You can also do staging or deployment for a few other, you know, developer -y reasons. But the settings can carry through uh, to each deployment slot, which is really cool. Um, and there's, you know, there's more that you can do. There's connection strings. Uh, if you're noticing, I have a lot of Let's Encrypt uh, environment variables or application settings in this Azure app. That's because I'm using Let's Encrypt for SSL. 
which is super awesome because you can actually do that through an extension. Uh, so if you've ever used extensions with Azure App Services, that's my first tip for you today. There is actually an Azure extension at the extensions marketplace that you can connect Let's Encrypt to your Azure apps to get free SSL encryption. You don't have to pay for it, uh, you know, a cert. So I have the Azure Let's Encrypt extension installed. Um, there's a there's a great way to get that if you just search. I think I actually got the tip from Hanselman's blog. Um, and it's really important to do SSL on your site these days. I'm not going to go into all the reasons why, but I really recommend it. Um, here's where you can actually get, and again, I'm just on Scott Hanselman's blog for securing an Azure app service under SSL in minutes with Let's Encrypt. He talks about you know how to do it in Azure, so I'm not going to repeat the steps, but this is a great way to understand how to do it. And, and when you do SSL, like I have here, HTTPS, then you can get some performance improvements along with security, uh, which is my next tip in terms of using Azure App Services with, with sites that are .NET. Um, if you go back and you look at the uh, app settings, I actually have HTTP 2.0 turned on. By default, you're gonna get 1.1 out of the box, which is the standard way you've always done things. But 2.0 is just like faster, flat out faster, and, and optimizes your site. And all those speed test tools, they love it. But you can't do this without having SSL. So get an Azure app, turn on SSL, get Let's Encrypt to get free SSL, and then turn on HTTP2 to get optimization for free out of your service. Um, it's pretty cool. But along with that, you know, the next thing that I would say, if you're working with Kensco EMS or Kensco Cloud, don't deploy files manually. You're going to actually want to set up the deployment center to talk to a branch. And that way, when that branch is edited or changed and made a commit, you can see I've got some commits here, it's going to automatically publish those files right to this Azure App Service. So I have my production slot tied to my master branch which is awesome because I don't have to worry too much about deployments. I'm the only one who can commit to master. But if I go back to my deployment slots, having a second deployment slot for staging is really neat because you can actually say, copy the exact application, have KStream staging as my slot, and now it gets its own set of app settings and configurations. And if we look at deployment slider for that slot, I can tie the CI that comes with an Azure app right here to a different branch. So right now I have it tied to a feature branch for a demo I gave. So that way I can actually toggle or make commits and I can actually push this code automatically to a different URL because this deployment center is mapped to the one branch. Uh, hopefully I didn't actually just click something there. I don't know why that can't give away. But anyways, um, when I do that, I get a different URL that runs because I'm right here. So I get the private Azure URL of kstreamnet-staging.azurewebsites.net and here I have it open in a browser if I refresh that you can see that now I have that different code branch tied automatically to this this URL and I can do all my testing pretty cool right so honestly that's one of the main benefits that you're not going to get with on-premise or you're not going to get with a virtual machine that's IaaS in Azure Cloud or some other AWS Cloud. These deployment slots, the way they tie, the way they have CI just built in. And then the big thing is when I'm ready, if I just know that this is the code I want to deploy, I can actually click this swap button and I can swap that code out right to production and I'm done with my deployment. It saves a lot of time. Uh, you got to be, you know, think through that process, right? It's not just automatic, but uh, honestly, that's one of my favorite parts of using Azure Apps. Now, again, I, I talked to a lot of people about how they use Kensco and Azure. One of the big things I see is a lot of people, they actually have their staging and their developer site in a deployment slot with one Azure app. That's not great. This is These slots are supposed to be temporary deployment tests only because they consume the same amount of resources that the production site consumes, right? In app, an Azure app service, as the resources of an Azure App Service plan. So if you have 10 Azure App Services, they all share what the Azure App Service is giving them to from a resource standpoint. So if I if I look at this and I go back to 
um, not just my staging deployment slot, but if I go back to the top level portion of my Azure App Service, you know, this is the thing that's actually showing here. I'm running kstream.net, uh, and I look at my actual scaling up plan. Um, it'll tell me that I'm actually I can scale up, but I'm I'm tying one plan. And actually, I'm running this whole thing on an an S1 plan for about forty four dollars a month. Uh, mainly, that's because I want a custom domain and I want SSL and I want to have staging slots. Um, but that's that's for one point. 1.75 gigs of RAM uh, and an A series compute, which is you know decent computing power. That's pretty cheap to host my .NET Core Kentico Cloud website, and that's also why I recommend it because you can do it for fairly cheap. Uh, I know there's probably ways to do it cheaper, but that's fine. So, anyways, honestly, I I'm just scratching the surface with with how much or how little that you could do with all these things. And I don't want to bore you to, to death with everything, and maybe we can go into part two later, but I just want to show you that, you know, you could take the code that we created here in our brand new project that we made with CLI, you know, it has our two projects and our solution. You could commit that to source control. You could, you could deploy it uh, or commit it, push it to your Bitbucket repo or your GitHub repo or whatever, ADO repo, and then click a few clicks to tie the branches from that repo to Azure App Service and you're off and running. So you don't need to, you know, do much more than that to get going with Kentico Cloud in Azure. Most of the things I've said today are still true for Kentico EMS, but you know, Kentico Cloud has got some really cool tools like the .NET Core or the Kentico Cloud MVC boilerplate that you can start with to get these things done really, really quickly up and running. So environment spin up, save some time, get done faster, continuous improvement, continuous deployment. All that really becomes possible with the things that we have available with .NET Core CLI and with Azure App Services. So you should go out and start using them today. I do recommend them wholeheartedly. And I think that's going to be it for today's podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a few things. I would encourage you to use these tools. And maybe next time I'll have a special guest on the recording. But other than that, I would say thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you all later.